what people haven't asked, at least we can't find a lot of studies prior to ours that explicitly asked whether or not, uh, or what people thought or felt about energy transition. So we specifically, we define energy transition as transitioning away from fossil fuels and towards renewables. And so we ask, uh, because this was kind of inductive, like normally my preference would be to use much more empirically driven deductive kind of research in my design. This is because this is new. This is very much a, well, how do we even write these questions? Things along those lines. So we'd uh, initially written things to see whether or not their uh, general attitudes towards moving away from fossil fuels were different than what people thought uh, moving towards renewables was like. And we've got good evidence to suggest that, especially in Alberta, people, these would be distinct attitudes. Um, and this is in fact what we find. So the super high level findings is that Oh, I should say, we were in the field immediately following the Alberta provincial election in 2019 in the spring, so about a year ago. Um, we used Vote Compass uh, for a few reasons. Um, getting any kind of quality provincial sample in Canada is expensive, and being able to use an online interface is good for our survey administration. Uh, what this meant, though, is that we've got a sample that is not quite... Uh, representative of the population of Alberta as a whole. So we've got um, a more middle-aged sample. So we've got fewer 18 to 25 year olds than in the population and fewer 65 plus. Uh, we have way more post-secondary grads than you'd have in the population as well. Uh, but crucially, we've got roughly the proportion that I think would agree that they work in oil and gas. So either directly or in an adjacent industry where people say, well, I work in oil and gas, but they're actually working in a corporate office in downtown Calgary or something like, or like a support service kind of thing. So they're not actually involved in extraction per se, but they're involved in something um, closely tied to industry. So I would take, I would use that as the kind of caveat to say it was immediately following an election where this is very politicized. Uh, and it was also uh, the population is, I think, more indicative of a key part of Alberta rather than, um, yeah, Alberta as a whole. Terrific. We, I think we understand the design of the survey now okay. and who you have and, and where you're a little heavy and where you're a little light. Give us your top couple of uh, findings, please. Okay. So in terms of uh, general attitudes towards transition, we've got a majority of people in that sample that say we should move away from fossil fuels. We have a super majority that say we should move towards renewables, so north of 80%. Um, we have... We asked about things like people should move for work. This has come up in previous studies in Canada where uh, it's the idea that people from Atlantic Canada or other part regions that are more economically depressed should be able to move to places or should be moving to places where they can get jobs. Um, Albertans would typically be the people who would say, yeah, you should do that because we've never had to do it in the same kind of way. Uh, that doesn't seem to load onto the attitudes related to transitions. Um, Things that really predicted high levels of support for transition were not just belief in anthropogenic climate change, but worry about it. So there were lots of people who like believed that it was a thing, but they weren't actually worried about it so much. Um, things that really pushed resistance to transition were prior attitudes towards energy. And as a political scientist, um, prior values and beliefs are always things that we would look at. And in politics, this would be about um, like ideology, partisanship, things along those lines. Uh, but for us, one of the biggest things were people who thought that oil and gas, particularly in Alberta, oil and gas is going to remain Alberta's top industry in the next 25 years. People who really, really sincerely believe that very forcefully are the folks that are super resistant to transition. And so this fits neatly into our existing understandings of how people develop attitudes towards new issues. They'll work to try to make it fit into their priors. And so we argue that prior things about ideology, prior things about partisanship, because this is really cued in a lot of partisan ways, short-term thinking about it anyway. Uh, and then prior ideas about energy and climate, but like especially energy in Alberta seem to be really important. Um, the finding that I find frustrating uh, is that people who really strongly have a market conservative ideology, so people who think that um, government should leave it to business to create jobs, people who think that economic redistribution is a bad idea, um, people who think that trickle-down economics 
is how things work, they too are heavily resistant to uh, energy transition. One of the things that uh, I've noticed over the last three or four years, Melody, I, I spend a lot of time with Abaca's data, mm -hmm. uh, polling data, because uh, they do this on a regular basis, and I, I find some of their stuff really, really insightful. And when they poll by province, I'm always surprised by, even though Alberta lags on attitudes toward climate policy and climate change and those kinds of things, nevertheless, there's, as you found in your survey, always a lot of support for a transition away from fossil fuels. A lot of people who think that oil will not play as big a role in the economy in 10 years or 30 years, but that's not reflected in the political culture. Uh, I would say it's political culture is a concept that I would like to avoid if at all costs, <laughs> but okay. I would say that. So one of the arguments that we make is that um, it's like only Nixon can go to China right until some political actors decide that it is in their short-term partisan interest to actually meaningfully speak about transition uh they're going to continue to do what they already i mean so until somebody like jason kenny thinks that it's actually in his interest to diversify how he talks about energy it's probably not going to happen another way of putting this is that as long as some parties think that it's going to be a short-term winner to uh, speak forcefully against transition or to speak forcefully against climate policies, they will continue to do so. It's, it's short-term thinking, uh, but it is effective. So, uh, I mean, for me, what was really interesting was the question that came to the Premier during uh, one of the health, public health briefings last week, uh, where, so the National Observer has published something about this. The, a Calgary journalist had said, well, is this a context where we might actually have to start thinking about energy transition a little bit more seriously, given the context. And it was interesting watching the premier. So I watched the clip very closely and he says transition. And then you can see that he pauses and he pivots to the Green New Deal so that he can make it about uh, AOC, ideology, Americans, like to make it a very much an that's them. Like we need to, like, if you are one of us, we, we think about this very differently. Um, I don't know if he's cueing very much that it's not ideological because it seems super ideological to me, but I'm primed to look for these sorts of things. But I found it really interesting that he deliberately, he said the word transition and then really deliberately backed away from that and then tried to make it very much about not Alberta, but then also proceeded to say that like, he was stunned that a Calgary journalist would even ask the question, which very much cues this, uh, it's polarized partisanship. And the reason why we say polarization is that it's making it about, it's not like extreme positions. It's about like, you're either with us or you're against us. And if you're against us, we have to beat you. It's an existential kind of frame. Uh, I wrote a column about that, uh, Melanie, and in it I argued <clears throat> that only two months ago, <clears throat> excuse me, only two months ago, the premier was down in Washington and he was sitting on a panel in which he mentioned he talked about energy transition. And then he gave an interview to Calgary columnist uh, Don Braid in which he said, look, I have a firm grasp of the obvious. We understand there's an energy transition going on that we will be using less fossil fuels and oil and gas down the road. Yeah. And now what and his response at that press conference is diametrically opposed to the thing he said two months ago. So do you think that maybe he got blowback on those comments and that's why he was kind of walking them back or uh, what, what's your take? I think I would assume that uh, what we saw in the press conference was a public facing short term strategy. And so I wouldn't actually expect any kind of consistency in the messaging. If it's a short term effective strategy, they'll hit the short term effective strategy on the assumption that most people aren't actually paying attention to the nitty gritty, gritty details of what they're actually doing in terms of transition. Um, or it could be that like he'll say to Don Braid, I understand that we need to do a transition and people who normally wouldn't say that the premier is getting this right will say, oh, it looks like he's actually being a little bit more sensible and moderate on this one. And then you proceed to have a whole bunch of nothing come along with it. So here's the thing. I would never underestimate the power of a short term ideologically driven strategy in a polarized partisan context. And that's why pol polarized partisanship is so important to understand that it's very much creating an us versus an other and that you want people to be emotionally invested in beating the other. So you can see it with the premier does this with uh, 
the federal government, particularly with the Trudeau Liberals, um, but he was very clearly doing that with the Green New Deal. That was a, that's what that was about. Um, I also think like there's other kinds of like political exigencies that relate to this too. I think it has to relate to where donations are coming from. I don't like it's. I think we'd be naive not to see that. Um, I also think that if people actually thought that the premier was sincere about doing energy transition. Um, he has had, based on that one column, he's said a number of other things, including the argument that because our oil is more ethical, um, and he's assuming that demand is going to stay high, like I think he's making a strong assumption, I think perhaps a too strong assumption about oil demand through 2050. And his argument is clearly we're more ethical than the Saudis, so pay more for our product for ethics. And like the market doesn't work that way. <laughs> so so there's, there's more than one set of inconsistencies. And so my interpretation would be the comments maybe made to Braid um, say would be a little bit, would be the ones that I would be a little bit more skeptical of compared to some of the other ones. So we, we understand that the, the people who identify strongly with the oil and gas industry are the least uh, supportive of the energy transition. Mm -hmm. What are some of the folks who are supportive of the energy transition? What do they look like? Well, they're worried about climate change. That's, that's pretty much it. Um, if we do the like kind of like sociodemographic background thing, so the way that we analyze this is we take things that are um, like as far away from current events and unchanging. So things like sociodemographics and then to see how those feed into fundamental values and beliefs and then how that feeds into things that are a little bit more proximate to an issue is an excellent model for explaining vote choice, but it also explains like emergence of new attitudes and things like this. We confirm stuff that you see in the literature. So gender matters, um, women are a bit more, uh, the argument is that women are a bit more altruistic or that they've got other values and beliefs that lead them to be more likely to say things like they're worried about climate change, things along those lines. Um, interestingly, things that didn't matter were things like partisanship, which I suspect will have changed quite dramatically now, in part because, uh, and our explanation for this is that the party system was very new in 2019, and so the UCP was a new party, the NDP as a, like a factor for government still seems very fresh in the Alberta context. Um, I suspect that if I looked at this federally, you would have basically every party but the conservatives being more supportive of things like energy transition and that the more people are associated with conservatives, the more likely they are to, or the more they identify with, and if it, particularly if they identify in that polarized kind of like existential way, that they're going to be the ones that would perceive most threat and then be the ones that are most likely to um, be resistant. The one comment I would make though is that because our levels are so high, so if you've got 80% people saying, yeah, we want more renewables, there's not a lot of, like, there's not a lot of room to go. I think we're, we're bumping into ceiling effects, which means that we find a lot more things that might drive people down from that level, but we're not finding a ton that pushes them up. But I wouldn't say, like, an incorrect interpretation would be that this means that there's more stuff that makes people opposed to energy transition. The, the correct interpretation is that people want it. Lots of people want it. And I think one potential explanation that you could have is that the people who have the ear of, say, provincial government are the ones that are most likely to be opposed. So market conservatives, um, strongly identifying with oil and gas, like UCP partisanship comes in there, it's pretty weak, but it still is kind of in there, and people who are more skeptical about climate change. And so those show up more forcefully in our model, but that's because there's a lot more room to go down than there is to go up. What are the implications of your research and your insight into these different uh, cohorts of voters for messaging and narratives around the energy transition? So this is one thing that we tested explicitly as well. So we used a survey experiment where um, one fifth of our participants just did the survey. Uh, two fifths heard a story about um, either indigenous nations who were opposed to a pipeline or indigenous nations that wanted to purchase a pipeline. And then we had another two fifths that were looking, heard a story about um, how energy transition to say, or basically how transition was either a great way to make money or uh, killing this small town. So I'll front load the critique right away. Um, a very strict experimentalist will say that our treatments are not identical, which means that they, um, 
uh, interpreting exactly what these means is we can be a little bit less forceful than what we could be in a different kind of context. The counter argument I would make is that they're based on real CBC stories. And what we wanted to do is to see whether or not hearing a story in passing that was very realistic, actually, if that actually moved attitudes. The literature suggests that it shouldn't. Um, individual stories rarely move opinion very much, uh, but it's the iteration of stories and it's the volume of stories that actually uh, has the more powerful effect on public opinion. Um, unsurprisingly, the indigenous stuff is noisy. We need to go back into the field and see stuff like this. What's interesting is that the, the indigenous anti-story that we used was the Wet'suwet'en protests, and we literally did not have to change the story from last year to this year. It literally was the same story. Uh, so we were really looking forward to seeing what we could find on that with a national sample, and then all of this happened. Where we got more clear results, though, was on the economic side of things. And this is where I find those market conservatives super perplexing, because when, we, when the people who were most like, who heard the solar story, so the story that we said was, here's solar, like the prices come down on solar. In Alberta, you've got the opportunity to make scads of money with it, basically. Or it's like a good economic opportunity. People who heard that story, like net of everything, it increased their support for transition. Our negative economic story was about, I get it confused because I'm a rural person and I get Hannah and Hinton confused, but it's one of the one where there's a coal transition and moving away from coal is basically killing the small town. And the really interesting thing is that people who heard that story, as in like, if we stop burning coal, uh, there's no, like, this small town is done. Uh, that, that also increased support for transition, albeit the effect is smaller, but it's still that's the direction it is going in. So normally research doesn't find these kinds of framing effects from a single story, right? So for us, that's particularly interesting. That positive and that positive news moves it is also really interesting. And that po negative news puts things in a positive direction is interesting for us too. This will be my last question for you and then we'll open it up to Q and A and let some of the, our attendees uh, ask questions. So, uh, my takeaway from what you just said is that uh, positive, uh, a volume of positive stories about the energy transition, whether it's solar or whatever it might be, ending, ending coal for power generation, that is most likely to move the needle on people's attitudes. Maybe. Um, but the other thing I would say with that is uh, I don't think people identify with coal the same way that they identify with oil or gas in Alberta. And so that could be a transition where or at least they don't anymore, right? The, that kind of coal-based identity would have been a much earlier 20th century thing. But yeah, I think it's fair to say that like, good news about how you can make money this way moves opinion. The more you hear that, I think the more you can say that like, if you're looking for a strategy, that would be it. I would also say that it is suggestive, I'm not sure I would build a strategy on this yet, but it's suggestive that um, localized negative news is maybe not so bad, right? I mean, so, and, and that makes sense to me. Like one reaction that you could have to um, transitioning away from oil and gas is really hurting this economy is by saying like, and I think many Albertans might be thinking this is right, which meant that we should have like gotten our ducks in a row to deal with this um, sooner than what we've done now. Or like we, this train has left the station. We really do need to scramble to get on it. Things along those lines. And so we need to do more work to sort out those positive and negative effects for sure. Um, but the other thing I would say is that people who have really strong priors, so people who were either um, firmly like identity based committed to oil and gas, uh, or like for other reasons of identity opposed to renewables, um, it doesn't matter what evidence you present them, they're just going to have a very emotional reaction. So I would anticipate that like most people are probably going to have a nice like a, probably a quiet, more positive kind of reaction, but that strategy would also be met with like massive blowback. And if this is a public thing, I would expect that the blowback is also probably going to have some kind of effect on what folks are thinking too. So it all iterates together. Okay, let's open this up to Q&A. Uh, please, uh, at the bar and underneath your, um, your video window, uh, you should find a little bar that allows you to put up your hand and then a blue hand will appear. Dave yeah, Patterson has already done that. So Dave, if you could unmute your mic, please, and ask your question of uh, Professor Thomas. Well, I'll give an example of, I guess, a positive um, ongoing example of perhaps the positive for solar. The Edmonton Convention Center 
They're replacing the windows with window modules that have solar, solar PV cells in them. Mm -hmm. And so that, that project takes a, a, you know, a, a, a maintenance cost, which is putting new windows in after, I don't know how many, 30, 30 years. And it, um, it turns it into it. I think it added $2 million to the cost of the window replacement but it turns that cost into a, a revenue stream that those windows will pay for themselves in, I think within the life of those windows. So you're, they're going to get, a, you're going to get, you get positive cash flow out of, out of solar projects, even, even, even if the return is small. Mm -hmm. So I think a, a little more publicity will, um, will, 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 um, you know, produce more, um, energy transition converts. Dave, if I can understand this correctly, so you're arguing that, that there are plenty of positive energy transition stories out there, like the one that you mentioned, and if we told more of them, we would have a tendency to move the needle. Uh, what's your take, Melanie? So, it, maybe. Uh, I, I think people would react to the stories, and this is why I think we get the difference between uh, like a lower number of people saying we should transition away from fossil fuels and a higher number of way people saying we should move towards renewables because I think the majority opinion is that this is idea that like fossil fuels are the core and renewables are nice to have and so this will add people into the idea that renewables are nice to have but they're still going to think that fossil fuels are the core so one of the things that we had and we asked it after the experimental treatments so I don't want to present it as kind of like population levels though we do with our control group I guess we asked people where we thought um, prosperity came from or how important um, fossil fuels like oil and gas and renewables were for varying levels of prosperity themselves, the province and Canada as a whole. And the 75% of Albertans think that like the province's prosperity is tied to oil and gas. The proportion of people who think that their personal prosperity is tied to oil and gas matches the people who say that they work in it. Um, so literally 75% of people are like, my personal prosperity has nothing to do with oil and gas, but the province, the province, like three and four of our sample are saying the province's prosperity um, has to do with oil and gas. And like one and two are saying that Canada's. Now it's interesting, renewables is up like, it's up there. Like it's a big, plur it's a plurality. It's not a majority, like 40% would say that um, the province's prosperity is tied to renewables. Um, but so the conclusion I would draw is that you can move renewables, but you also need to change how people are thinking about fossil fuels. And I think this is why we need to be attuned to the political strategy because this myopic focus on oil and gas in Alberta, like there's a lot of work that's being done at the political elite level to connect the province synonymously to energy and energy is synonymous only with oil and gas, not with the rest of it. And so, and I think if I were to go into the field today, I would say that I would probably get more than 75% of Albertans saying that the province's prosperity is tied to oil and gas. So. Uh, Melanie, while, we're wait, yeah. while we're waiting for the next question, I, I have a, a question for you. Yeah. And <clears throat> did you test or do you have an opinion about the idea that uh, what if the hydrocarbons, and we're thinking bitumen into carbon fiber, for instance, and natural gas into petrochemicals and blue hydrogen, mm -hmm. uh, if, how would, might that test where you're saying, yes, we still have hydrocarbons, which have been our base of our pro of our prosperity, but we're going to do something different with them. Would, the, that, would that change people's attitudes towards the energy transition? I suspect that most people, if we surveyed on that, would not know how they would react to it, right? Um, we, yeah. And so I think if you could generally message to say, we're using bitumen to produce green energy like this is consistent with how a lot of people want to think about alberta as like energy innovators and that we actually have the cleanest fuel and this would be this would fit consistently with that so you'd have to simplify the messaging and if you if it was genuinely a we're using our like less clean product or like european would probably say a dirty product to make clean energy then it would be like you could create this kind of like look at our broad history of innovation narrative and that would kind of work. 
But I think if you just ask people straight up about it, most of them would just fumble and say that they didn't know. In the study, again, post-treatment, um, we had asked people where they wanted their energy electricity to come from. And so this is bolstering our idea that like how they think about fossil fuels versus coal versus electricity are actually different things. But we still said like, here's like Alberta's electricity comes from coal, like 48%. And then the rest of it comes from these other sources. Um, where do you want it to come from? Like just figure out, like tell us from all of these possible sources where you'd like it to come from in 2030 and where you'd like it to come from in 2050. And what we find with this is that, um, people really want renewables. So they want upwards like of 20% of their electricity to come from renewables if you give them this particular exercise. Some people want nuclear, you get the same level of opposition to solar as what you do to nuclear, which I think is a, I suspect that's a particular quirk of people who hate <laughs> renewable energy in Alberta, like a small bunch of folks that way. Um, but we got in the open-ended comments, we just kind of always tack on just to see what people reacted to in the study. We didn't give them the opportunity to say that they didn't know. We forced them to answer that question. And people, like they did it, but they didn't like it. Like they wanted to say, hey, I don't know about this stuff. So they got mad that we're just like, we figure you can sum to 100%, like just like blue sky this, whatever. So they did it, but they didn't like it. Um, Zach Trolley has got a question. Uh, Zach, if you can unmute your mic and ask your question, please. So I find this um, the, the survey results interesting in that it kind of gives you a bit of a guide on how to communicate these things better. Um, do you have a synopsis of like use these terms and not these other terms to elicit positive responses so that like when we're talking with friends, family on LinkedIn, et cetera, we can be better at communicating these things? Uh, I don't. Um, and what's interesting is that we had initially when we had pitched this said that we wanted to use the tested narratives from the Alberta Narratives Project. I don't know if folks are familiar with that, but it was a focus group driven um, exercise to test, to see whether or not narratives from government, narratives from industry, narratives from NGOs, uh, if like what narratives actually were the most persuasive for people in general. And we've, I think, naively assumed that that project would actually like give us narratives. Um, and what they found is that uh, their conclusion is that you really just need to meet people where they're at, which is deeply frustrating. Uh, <laughs> uh, so the conclusion is that there is no narrative, like nobody liked the language that government was using, nobody liked the language that NGOs were using, um, like, and the reactions were predictable, right? Like, they kind of like raw Alberta, people are like, eh, I don't know about that so much, and like the do it for your kids, like, people were skeptical of this as well. So. Generally, I would say a lot of the canned language already, like that project shows that folk don't like it. So what I would advise instead is that you do need to know, it's not enough to say like meet people where they're at, you need to know where they're at. Like for a market conservative, somebody who says like government should stay out of the, of the market, like business should do these sorts of things, business should create jobs, trickle down economics works. The question I would put to them, the challenge is, so why do you not want to make money in renewables? Like this looks like, like in what other context would you say that you wouldn't want your portfolio uh, diversified and with as many fingers and as many pies to make as much money as you possibly can? Like I actually, I, I mean, I'm not a market conservative myself, so I, I don't know why like we're seeing that kind of association between people who should want to make money or like not moved by the money making stuff in renewables and things. Um, for people who like believe in climate change, but aren't worried about it, I actually, this is counter to some of the literature, but I actually think that messaging that makes people worried, like it's a very targeted argument. You can't generally make folks worried about this, but for people who believe but are not fussed, actually trying to fuss them up might be useful as well. And so I wish I could offer something more generalizable, but Instead, I would say, if you understand where somebody is coming from, you can hit them with a pretty targeted message that hopefully would move them. Yeah. Melanie, um, I wonder if you can clarify this for me. Um, if you were looking at developing messaging to move the needle on the energy transition in Alberta, would you recommend uh, more focus on the climate crisis and making people anxious and and you know, wanting change there? Or would you go with a hope and optimism message on gaining you know, benefits from you know, investing in renewables and, and other aspects of, 
uh, of the you know new energy technologies? I would go with neither. I would, the first thing I would do is try to broaden what counts as energy in a place like Alberta. So, and this is in, like, you go to a place like Quebec and Quebec thinks that they're amazing at this because for them, energy is hydro uh, and energy is electricity. And so they see that they've got like renewable forms of like a renewable form of electricity. And like, you can see that there's a proud identity with Quebec Inc and stuff like this there as well. And so I think step one is like breaking this lockstep between energy in Alberta and oil and gas. And you can hear it federally as well. So the people who are invested in keeping these things tied um, are doing a very effective job. And so I would break that. And then um, because everyone uses the language anyway, annoying as it is, I would like, pull the maverick entrepreneurial stuff. It's like that display at the Glenbow. I don't know if anybody's been to the Glenbow Museum, but like the Mavericks, it's like the Lockheed and the like energy and like the, you know, the oil cowboys, all these other sorts of things. Um, and I remember like, there's a reason why I would want to make energy bigger and more entrepreneurial because there's this fatalism that I hear, particularly in Calgary about the idea of like, we're entrepreneurial, but we're entrepreneurial only with oil and gas. And if we don't have that, we don't have anything. And so the message needs to be like, bullshit. Like, of course, there's, there's a lot, like, you can tell, like, I'm a rural Alberta kid who's, like, community transitioned away from its main industry hard when I was in high school. Like, it was very clear to my brother and I that we were just kind of like, well, that local industry, <laughs> grain farming, we can't do that. <laughs> we have to, like, so, like, transitions are, like, not, unique. like, this is a big one. Certainly, but this is not the first time that people have been to this rodeo before, right? And so I wouldn't focus on climate per se. I wouldn't focus on hope, to, hope and optimism. I, I would actually like hit the entrepreneurial nerve and be like, get with the program. Like, let's, let's, let's go with this. We do this. So like, why are we not doing this? Fascinating. Um, Pat Letizia, if you could unmute your mic and ask a question of Professor Thomas, please. Um, Melanie, I was just wondering if, um, you, I know you, you, you referenced the Alberta Narratives Project. Mm -hmm. Have you, are you familiar with the national um, communications research that went on after that, that kind of built on it? I am less familiar with that, yeah. Um, because, well, I'll just give you a quick um, recap. The, uh, we did both a qualitative and quantitative kind of approach, and so um, Louise Como, who was a researcher on the qualitative side, mm -hmm. she looked at 80 different NGO, you know, environmental NGO kind of messages across the country yeah. and started testing narratives and um, came up w w through her research with kind of three main frames, like narrative, narrative frames that, that seemed to really work. And at the same time, um, Erica Chappelle at the University of Montreal was doing this quantitative research on um, mm -hmm audiences and so you know we traveled across the country talking to angles about what you know these are the messages you're using nobody's really paying attention this is what the research yes. says you know do you want to try that and um and then we put a bunch of money on the table and let people try it and um utilize this and what we found too was that environmental organizations are really good at communicating to their funders and their donors, but they don't really know how to reach the different audiences that are, they're, they're trying to kind of change the behavior of or reach in some way that's compelling for them. And um, I think that, well, the, the, the three audiences were women, young millennial voters, and new Canadians who are all kind of open to um, talking about climate change because for a number of reasons they have concerns about it. and the three frames that um, came out were um, weather, that everybody in Canada talks about the weather. And I've actually tested this in elevators with strangers, um, just dropping the climate change when someone talks about the weather. And there, you know, the, there's this instant, yeah, you're right. You know, and, and so I've, I've actually tried that several times, even with people who, are, who won't talk about climate change initially. Mm -hmm. uh, it seems really Pat, simple. Pat, do you mind asking a question of, of Melanie? We're running out of time. I'm sorry. 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 Yeah, I just wanted to know if if you had made that connection and it, if it would be helpful to have access. So, to them. Yeah, access would be great. What were the other two frames? Weather and health. Health, health. Yeah. Uh, especially with mothers and new Canadians yeah. and 
uh, transition outside of Alberta transition is really on everybody's mind. Yeah. Uh, so a few comments about that. Um, women, millennials and immigrants are also consistently chronically um, like very severely, particularly in the case of women, um, politically underrepresented and marginalized. <laughs> so like in my, when I'm not doing this kind of work, I do gender and politics scholarship. So part of me is like, I'm not surprised that these are the constituencies that actually care about this stuff because they're also not the ones that we see in electoral politics. So getting this connection between electoral politics and, um, and this particular issue is key. I think weather is so good because like anecdote, but like my dad immigrated to Canada from the Netherlands in 1970. And he can tell you how in the seventies, you'd get an east wind in Southern Alberta and 48 hours it would rain. And you could guarantee that you would like dry land farming wasn't a problem because you actually had precipitation. And now I've never seen crops burn so early and so bad in the field. And the thing is, they can talk about they can talk about climate change. They talk about it like the weather, and they take this decades long view. This is, I think, one of the most underutilized ways to actually get in to speak to people who. So, like making the connection between weather and climate is good. The next step, where I think I know I'm a little bit more fuzzy, and I suspect I'm not the only one, is the making the connection to climate, and then the so what are you going to do about it, and what does what does that mean? That's I think a bit of a challenge, as well, um, and. The one thing I would flag on the political side of things, because I'm a political scientist and I can't help it, is I think that the political project to present Alberta in like hostile opposition to the federal government is all about framing that transition narrative elsewhere. Um, also identifying Quebec and British Columbia as others that need to be fought. Like this is all part of the same political polarization. And the problem with that is precisely because other Canadians are going to be like, I don't know. I mean, we know that like a majority supported the public purchase of the Trans Mountain Expansion Project, but that still leaves a lot of people who are opposed. And that strikes me as malleable as well, right? And so when you've got other Canadians, particularly like Quebecers saying, we should transition uh, because we don't like, it's easier to say this in Quebec because there's, they just maintain the status quo more than a big a bit of a shift. But like the regionalism is being stoked and primed as a, I, I think the bigger strategy that I see is that that regionalism is stoked and primed deliberately to like make those conversations about transition, not about transition and to make them about regional fights and equalization or something like it's just to like, just make sure that those debates never land anywhere. Melody, thank you very much for coming out today. This has been fascinating and uh, very interesting. In fact, I think I, I can think of a few threads that we'll want to talk about uh, in future interviews. Thank you very much for your time again. Really appreciate it. Thanks everybody for coming out. And there will be a recording on the uh, our YouTube channel sometime today uh, for anybody else who uh, wants to watch it again or send it around. Share with your friends, family, and your network. Thanks. Thanks a lot, folks. Take care. Thank you.